so-and-so committed fraud, they did this or that, but underlying that is one key internal control that's often missing. What is it? It's a lack of segregation of duties. That's the key internal control that we need in our organization, that corporations in America need in their organizations as well. So why is it also that we're talking to you today? Because everywhere our internal auditors go, PwC, every time they come to your campus, every time they come to system, every time they come to the controller's office, every time they come to Columbia, St. Louis, Kansas City, or the hospital, what's the one consistent finding in every office? Lack of segregation of duties. In every office we find it. Every campus we find the same thing over and over. That's why it's important for us to talk about it, to talk about, first, what is it? So our goals today are this. Our goals are, first, to make sure you clearly understand what is segregation, and second, you walk away with, I can go back home and I can do this. I can put it in my office and make sure that we comply with the policy. So we worked on this policy. When I say we, that means myself, the controller, my internal control manager, and the accounting directors. The accounting directors from each one of the campus, and not only that, but your accounting director has involved people in their office and fiscal officers, managers, all across their campuses. How long has that been going? Been going on a year and a half. Ordinarily, we can do a policy in three to six months, and we're done with policies. Okay? But this one has gone through 52 revisions. That's a lot of different times when we revisit and we re-meet and re-meet and talk about this policy. That tells you an indication of why this is important and how hard it is. All right? What we had to do was we had to strike a balance. That was the key was we had to strike a balance of the staffing level that you have about how can we do something and, and put a policy on you that you can do. So we're trying to say we we're understand that we don't have all the staff in the world. But the other hand, I've just told you that we need strong internal controls. So how do those two things mix? Strong internal controls oftentimes mean I need lots of staff in the perfect scenario in the optimal environment. On the other hand, nobody here is going to say, oh, I have all the staff I need. We're all fleshed out good, and we have all of the opportunity that we need to make improvements. We don't need any more staff. We're okay. So I don't have many people saying that. So what we're going to try to do is to strike a balance with this policy and the training with how can I do it today, how can I do it with the staff I've got. So hopefully we'll walk through some scenarios Maybe you can go home and make some slight improvements in your office and say, we can change this, we can change that, and it really won't impact our, our uh, effort that we have to have. So that's kind of the idea behind this policy. The first thing we want to do is talk about these five things. These five key elements of segregation of duties are these. They relate, four of them relate to transactions. That's going to be the focus of our discussion today is the transaction process. But all five of them combined are authorization, recording, verification, custody of assets, and managerial review. Now, the one thing I'm going to be light on today will be the custody of assets. So if your office doesn't have a lot of assets, um, it's probably not going to be a concern. But for some of you, we're going to have some additional steps that you're going to want to take. The policy became effective October 1st. It's posted on the controller's website under the Accounting Policy and Procedures Manual. So you can go there. If you lose this hard copy you've got today, please feel free to go to the controller's website, download any of the policies in Word, and uh, reprint them. So, like John said, there's a couple of policies. There's this one that we're going to talk about this morning on the basic fiscal management regarding segregation of duties. Now, this afternoon, you're going to talk about not only do you need to look at segregation of duties if you have sponsored activity. Anybody here in there got sponsored activity? Yeah, most of you, right? It's hard not to in, a, in an institution of higher ed to have sponsored activity. So if you do have sponsored activity, you're going to absolutely want to attend. And that process is going to talk like this. It's going to talk about, yes, you need to do everything you learned this morning regarding segregation duties. And in addition, if you're a PI or you have any other grants activity, there are additional steps you need to take. So we're going to talk about the first key thing that we talked about a minute ago, authorization. We mentioned that as one of our key functions. Sometimes the PI isn't always around in the office and is able to sign and authorize every transaction. So what do they do? They oftentimes want to delegate and say, look, you know enough about the grant. You're perhaps a co-PI. I'm going to delegate some of that signature authority to you. And so that's what this afternoon's discussion is. How do we do that? Is that okay to do it? When is it okay? When is it not? So that'll be a great uh, discussion this afternoon. I hope you'll enjoy too. 
So this morning we're going to talk about some uh, just good guidelines, general guidelines about segregation. This afternoon will be grants. If you have grants, you've got to come. If you alone have to come, that's one thing. But if you can bring other people with you that need to hear about segregation duties, I would absolutely recommend uh, that you have them attend. If you can get a PI to come with you, ask them to come. Beg them to come. You won't be sorry. Segregation of duties is one of those things that's uh, difficult for us to kind of get the idea of who's responsible for it. We could say, well, it's the president. It's the president of every corporation, every institution in America and any throughout the world that's responsible. They're the one that's responsible for internal controls. It's their job to make sure that internal controls are in place and effective and operational in our university. Well, is that where it stops? Not really. It's also the Vice President of Finance and Administration. That's Nikki Krawitz. It's her job as well to make sure that we have strong controls. But you know, she doesn't have time to sit here and do all the policies and write policies with us and come down here and train everybody that she needs to do. So instead, she says, it's Jane's job. It's the controller's job. Jane, you go do it. What does Jane do? She says, Steve, you go do it. <laughs> all right, so what do I do? I have to have an internal control manager to help us develop policies to make sure that we have strong internal controls system-wide across all campuses, all right? And that's not where it stops either. You can guess where I'm going next. It's Andy's job, right? Andy and his job, where's Andy? He's ducked out. And it's Andy's job also, right? So it's his job to make sure that he has good controls on his campus. But then it doesn't stop with Andy, it goes to us. It goes to us that are here in this room. So if your supervisor has delegated you the responsibility to come today, if they even know you're attending, the expectation is already set that you will implement internal controls and provide your office with good, strong internal controls. So whose job is it? It's our job. It's my job. All right? It's everybody's job that's here. We can't say somebody else is managing that. I'm going to let somebody else take care of that. That's our job to do. We have to do segregation of duties. So what is it I'm trying to do when they're talking about that? We have two overarching goals today. So I'm going to um, talk about two things. There's this, these two benefits we've got. Then I'm going to talk later about three things. So I'm going to talk kind of today over and over about two things and three things. Twos and threes. All right, so try to remember that with me. There are two overarching goals with segregation of duties. One is that we're going to try to mitigate the risk of fraud. We're going to try to detect errors and irregularities in the ordinary course of business. Now, I'm going to restate that like this. Our goal is not to prevent fraud. My goal is not to prevent all errors. We don't have enough money in the world, enough staff in the world to do that. Okay, we just can't. So we're all humans. We're going to make mistakes. The question is then, how do I catch those? We want, we want to acknowledge that, yes, we do make mistakes. That's a normal human uh, characteristic that we have. But whenever I do that, somebody needs to be detecting them. Somebody needs to find them and get them fixed, right? And when do we do that? We do that during May and June at the end of the year during closing. No, that's not when we do it. Come on. <laughs> the ordinary course of business means I'm doing it every day, day by day. I have an ordinary process that's in place that helps me find and detect these errors. Don't wait until the end of June. That's not the time to scrub our debt IDs, to go scrub your grant, make sure it's not in a deficit. It's an everyday process. So that's one key thing. As far as fraud is, we can't prevent it. There's always this thing called collusion. If two or three people agree together, yes, you can subvert the system and you can go and defraud the university and misappropriate funds. It's possible to do, but you gotta make sure you gotta have a trusted friend. They may get a little antsy about it, so that's really risky. So the issue is, how do I make it difficult to execute fraud? How do I kind of have enough controls in place so that it becomes difficult and I can help reduce that risk. And that's some of the things we're going to discuss today is how do I sort of uh, mitigate that risk? And that's where we're at. So the, the first introduction to this policy is this. In terms of what is it about, this is the core essence of segregation of duties. That means that optimally, there's three things I want to get you out of this slide. The word optimally, no one person can have more than one duty. 
Those are the three pieces we need to get out of this slide. Now, I want you to focus for just a second on the word should. Okay? So I won't tell you that I'm not going to use the word must. If we could, as accountants, as a good educated accountant, we have put the word must there. Okay? It's not an absolute requirement. We can use the word should. So what we're talking about is, in an optimal world, if I had all the staff in the world and all the flexibility in the world, this is what I do. I would give every person in my office, I'd say, so-and-so, you can do authorization. You can't do anything else. Go to the next person, you will do recording. You'll record journal entries, vouchers, CRRs. You will do nothing else. You can't sign, you can't verify, you can't do a review. Next person, you'll do verification and so on. All right? So that's what good sec the optimal environment for segregation would be. Okay, so that nobody does more than one thing. Now, does anybody here have five people in their office that has this segregated like this? Nobody? You got one. All right. You are the one exception. I have talked to almost 350, 400 people, and you're the one. <laughs> All right. So far, it is almost impossible for us to think about and put in place five people in every office that can say, I do nothing but one thing, nothing more, nothing less. That's really difficult. So the rest of the session today is going to do this. It's going to talk about how do I not live in this optimal world? What do I do next? Because I'm in the real world, all right, where we have two or three people in office. Now what do I do? Okay. So whenever I do have less than optimal people, less than optimal segregation office, there are some things that we're going to call compensating controls. Those compensating or mitigating controls help me say, all right, I have this thing of where I can't give one person only one thing. So now what do I do? I need to take extra measures, maybe some extra steps to say, let's still try to do one of my two things, mitigate the risk of fraud, detect errors in the ordinary course of business. So whenever I can't do that with five people or four people, then what do I do? I put some other controls in place. There are these three controls that we've got. Three controls or three additional measures. I can do either more detail, I can do something more frequently, or perhaps in my office, if I have two or three people and the office down the hall from me has one or two people in it as well, whenever their person's on vacation, I'm going to do their job for them. It's not a big burden. It's only for a week. I'll do double time and we'll have our people do their work for them for a week. Likewise, my person's on vacation, they're doing mine stuff for a week. Okay? That's a good fair trade. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So our three solutions are either do more detail, more frequent, or shared resources. So those are real options. People are using those. Once we've introduced this topic, they are employing that on campuses. So I encourage you to, to um, look at that. So that's kind of the theory of segregation in terms of you get the idea we've got to segregate those four or five things. And it'd be great if we only had one person doing each one of them. But now I want to talk about in detail about what, is the, what are those elements called authorization, recording, verification? So here's what those elements are. If we talk about authorization alone, that means that an individual, whoever has been appointed, delegated in your office to say, you are an authorized signer. That's what authorization is about, is being an authorized signer. That means that I have responsibility to do certain things. What are those certain things? An authorization for a transaction is this. It means I'm taking my chart fields, whatever my chart fields are, fund department, program, project, class, and account number, and I'm connecting that with money. So whenever I say spend this much money from this funding source or these chart fields, that's what we call a transaction. And authorization is whenever I take that document that has that on it and I sign it. I may sign it electronically, may sign it manually. But that's when authorization happens. It's whenever I'm taking chart fields with money and I'm signing it. All right? As an authorized signer. That's when authorization happens. Now, the odd thing that we're going to talk about for just a minute is we're going to live today in the theoretical world. The theoretical world is 
that things get authorized. We have authority to make a transaction. Then somebody's going to record it. Then we're going to review it. And then the, my manager's going to review it. That's the theoretical world, the perfect world. Now, in reality, you know in our university that sometimes we actually record a transaction because we're in a hurry. I'll get it signed later, tomorrow, today, whenever. One example is journal entries. You can go straight to the system, make a journal entry, and then somebody can go online later and approve it. Or I can print it out and have somebody approve it. Same for a voucher. You key in a voucher, print it out, have your authorized signer sign it. Then we send it to accounting, right? So they don't always happen in the, the perfect sequence. But just for today, let, allow me that we're going to talk about authorization first, then, ver then the, um, the recording happens. So it may not happen for you every time like that. But now, whenever this person is doing it, whenever this person is authorizing something in the first step, they're assuming or agreeing to something. Whenever I sign a document, I'm agreeing that that transaction that I have complies with our collected rules. It complies and agrees with all of our accounting policies, all of our HR policies, our procurement. All right. Anything else? Business policy manual. Any policies we have, it needs to comply with all of those. It needs to comply with all the sponsored programs agreements. So we have compliance agreements we have to be looking at. It has to be a legal transaction. So regardless of the fact that, you know, there's nothing in the policy that states I can't buy this or that, still, if it's not a legal transaction, I cannot make the transaction. Please don't do things that are Ill illegal just because our policy doesn't state that or specifically exclude something. It's still our obligation to make sure that we have legal transactions. Finally, I'm going to look for budget. Do I have budget availability or not? So it's our job as managers to look and say, I have to be fiscally responsible and not overspend my budget. So those are the things that I'm agreeing to whenever I sign something. So our question then is, I get a document, and I know most of the stuff on it. It looks pretty good, and I ship it on. The problem with that is, if I don't know all of it, if I'm not certain about every piece of that transaction, I should not sign it. Please do not sign transactions. Do not authorize transactions unless you are absolutely certain, I mean completely certain, that it complies with our collected rules, our policies, compliance policies, and it's a legal transaction and I have budget for it. Those are key, key elements of us authorizing things. It is our responsibility. If you're an authorized signer, you cannot count on someone else later to say, so-and-so will look at it. That's Andy's job, right? It's his job to be the police and make sure that we sign things or that things are good, right? He'll make sure the account's right, right? No, it's not his job. He, can't be, he cannot know enough about every transaction. Neither can somebody else. It's our job as authorized signers. It's your job and mine to make sure that that buck stops with me. It's my job. I have to make sure that that transaction complies with those things. So that's a key part of authorization. Now, one other tidbit about authorization that we all know is that we can't sign our own travel, right? So we have some policies in place and some mechanisms that will prevent us from doing that. Right? Everybody knows what that happens. So you, you can sign it, yeah, as the traveler, and then I hand it off to my boss, and they sign it, and then they ship it on to accounting and so on. So, why is it that we have something like that in place? Why is it that I can't sign loan travel? That's a good idea. I could pay myself for trips that weren't made, maybe. All right? So, that's why we cannot sign our own travel. What do we call that? We call that, remember one of my two objectives, deter fraud. So, that keeps me from even being tempted to execute fraud. If, it makes, if we've built in a process and a policy that makes it difficult, we've achieved one of those key objectives of deterring fraud. Not only that, but if I'm signing my own stuff, I complete the voucher, do everything, and I sign my own stuff, and then get it recorded or record it myself, what's my other objective? Finding errors? Who's going to be checking my work? Nobody's checking my errors. So that's one of those reasons we have processes in place is that we're deterring fraud and somebody's got to be checking my work to make sure I'm not making errors. One key thing you're going to, I hope you're going to be talk about 
and I uh, just mentioned several times, will be documentation. We must have documentation of this authorization or any, any of the things that we're going to do today. We've got to have documentation, and I have to be able to reproduce it. All right? So one of the things that we often hear when we go visit with departments is, I trust so-and-so. They've been here 20 years, and this one's been here 15 years. You know, these guys do their work every day diligently. They come to work all the time. They're great workers. I trust them. That's why I trust them with my signature, and I trust them to, to do their job and review their financials. Okay? Um, whenever I was going to school, and uh, maybe it's changed, but trust was never mentioned as an internal control. Okay? It's one of those things we can't rely on. As much as I like my staff, I can't, I can't trust them in that way. Some things I have to review. It's my job as a manager to review some things. So trust is not one of those things that I can count on or rely on. Now, that means that if I can't produce documentation that says somebody signed it, somebody reviewed it, then what do you think the auditors are going to do? They're not going to trust me. They're going to say, you never did it. If you can't prove it, if you can't show me, it never happened. Those are not good words we want to have. Okay? We need to be able to demonstrate to our auditors and to our stakeholders, my constituents, the general public of Missouri, our donors and our sponsors, we need to be able to demonstrate responsibility and document our activities. So that documentation can be in the form of writing, can be a hard copy or electronic. Either one is acceptable. So we'll go into more details on those in a few minutes if you have questions about them. The next step in my process, I've got something signed. Now I'm going to record the transaction. This one's not real hard, folks. You, you can tell me what recording is. It's examples of like making journal entries, making CRRs. It's literally putting my fingers on the keyboard and recording a transaction in General Ledger. Whatever I'm doing, as soon as that transaction posts to General Ledger, it is then recorded or transacted in general in our financial system. So, um, recording out of these processes we're going to talk about, my four process, main processes or functions, recording is one of the key functions that we really need to carefully consider segregation for. Out of all of them, if I had a choice to say, well, do I want to segregate authorization, verification, recording, managerial review, this would be the key one. This is the one that should bubble up to the top. Okay, If you're going to do anything, please focus on recording. Now, oftentimes, here's the problem with recording. In my office, probably in your office, the person recording transactions doesn't necessarily have to have high accounting skills or a lot of other requirements. Unfortunately, that person often works for a supervisor who does and says, go record this, go record this, and go record that. Okay, when that happens, that means in some way, if I'm a recorder, I've lost my independence in terms of looking for that fraud, looking for errors. I'm no longer independent. When my boss says, go do it, what do I usually do? I go do it, right? I'm a good accountant. I go do my job. So that means they're going to go do it. And what happens now whenever I'm keying in a transaction, I'm keying in something, and I, I know we bought some equipment and so on. So I'm keying in uh, our 60-inch plasma screen and a glass case to hold the CDs and uh, I print the voucher out, and I take it to Jane, the controller, and have her sign it. And it occurs to me, why on earth does a controller need a 60-inch plasma screen? Hmm. Might be a good question to think about. I think I'll ask her, put her on the carpet and say, you know, I don't think we should be buying that. She's thinking, you know, Steve, it's really been great having you work here. You know? <laughs> so, you know, those, I don't want to have that conversation, maybe. I like it being employed. So what do we do? We have something that we put in place to give me a little safety blanket. Not a little one. It's a great safety blanket. All right? So here's the first quiz question. If you were approached by an auditor, and I'm going to tell you this, they do come to departments. If any of you have been asked this question, you can, you can understand what it feels like. But they will come to your department sometimes and ask a random question that says, if you think or suspect your supervisor or somebody in your office is misappropriating funds, then what would you do? And they'll leave the question right there. What's our answer going to be? Give me a hint, somebody. Report it. To who? 
to my boss, the one that's uh, suspected of fraud. That probably won't work, right? <laughs> report to accounting. Report to which website? Excellent. There's a, there's a website out there that you can report fraud to, or even suspected fraud. That is the answer. All right. Whenever I got asked that answer two years ago, I didn't know the answer. We did not have a solution. Since then, the last year, we've put in something called the Physical Misconduct Hotline. The Physical Misconduct Hotline. All right. It's a website that you can go and report incidences or suspicions. All right. The last thing I want to do is go to my boss and say, you know, I don't think you should be making that transaction. Or maybe I'll go to somebody else or her supervisor and say, what do you think about this? And then eventually it gets back to her. So I don't want that to happen either. So this is a way that we have reduced or minimized the risk of my employment to me. All right. So that way I don't have to fear for my job at all. We can go to that fiscal misconduct hotline, put in the request or put in the incident anonymously. They'll never know my name. We've contracted with a company, a third party, that will do this for us. So not only that, but then they give the report to somebody internally here, and they follow up on it. And even, even then you see that there's no way it can be traced back to me. So we have no fear of reporting the transaction or the incident. The second way is there's a toll-free number. You can call in if you'd rather not put it on the Internet. That's fine, too. So you can call in. Third way is there is a, phone, a local contact number if you'd rather contact somebody here locally. Then you can call, I think your contact is Steve Malott, and you can report it directly to their office. So we got you three different ways. All right? But if you suspect that, if your sus staff suspect that anywhere in your office, their first words need to be, I would report it to the misconduct hotline. So if you take a second, if you jotted it down, I want you to write the words physical misconduct hotline. You can find that on, the, on our website on the Vice President Administration. So that's something that's key. Whenever we're talking about recording, this person, this one person is in a very awkward spot. All right? So that's where that's this, the role they play. And they need to have a safety net beneath them. So when we've talked about segregation, I've told you the university as a whole has had a segregation problem for the last several years. And what have we done? We've plugged that hole now with this physical misconduct hotline. Now we have independence for this guy recording. So that's, on, that's enough on recording. The next step in our process is to verify that transaction. So I got it authorized. I recorded it. Now I've got to verify it. That means somebody is going to do something really simple. They're going to go look at the transaction I signed that says, Steve signed for these chart fields this much money on this date. What else am I going to do? I'm going to go look at general ledger on the transaction checklist and say, it looks like these chart fields, this much money, note that date. What am I going to do? Check the box. That's about it. That's what verification is. It's simply validating that what got authorized got recorded. Nothing complex, nothing real hard. I'm just checking to make sure that whatever got signed for, that's what somebody typed in. So optimally, no one would verify the same things that they authorized. So we're starting to get away from the optimal just a minute. But optimally, I would not verify something that I just signed for a couple of days earlier. How come? I don't check my work very good, do I? Does anybody in here make mistakes? Some people no, some people yes. I've only got four or five hands. So <laughs> the problem is that if I just authorized something a couple of days ago, Am I real likely to check it real good, to verify it? Eh, maybe, maybe not. Okay, I'm human, and I, I know there's two sides of me. One is I know I do make mistakes. The other is I probably didn't make a mistake two days ago. So it's probably okay, and I check the box. All right? That's our temptation is to not really check our own work very well. One uh, final element, I think, on verification is this that it does confirm whenever that verifier is looking to see did the transaction get authorized and I'd like to know who recorded it All right, to know that I do have segregation in place if my boss has already told us that we need to segregate recording from authorized signers we say this person records this person authorizes and they don't mix then whenever I'm looking at that during the verification phase 
I need to be looking at those things once in a while and say, yes, so-and-so is still signing and this other person is doing all the recording. Thumbs up, that's a good transaction. So that's one of the things that the verifier does is confirm also that the control is in place every day, that it's working the way we thought it was supposed to. Again, key element is, got to document it. Didn't document it, it never happened, right? So what's an easy way to document this? A transaction checklist, right? The transaction checklist allows me to go online, review anything about the transaction, drill down to it. Then I simply go and check the box. And when I do that, it records my user ID and the date that I did it. It's excellent documentation. It's a great permanent record. Where is that again? The transaction checklist. It's on every web report on our income statements. Andy, do you want to? Uh, you may want to follow up with her and uh, help her work through the transaction checklist. It's a great free tool for everybody to use. It's been developed. It's good, good documentation. All right, here's some of the examples we've got um, in addition to our transaction checklist. We have things like our P-card statement. The P-card statement, as an example, uh, has all the transactions listed, and it's got the authorized signer on it and somebody else signing it, whoever the P-card owner was, at least those two people, and maybe a PI. So it has, you see that, uh, those transactions happening, and it's got a verifier on it. So during the P-card statement, we're going to see the elements of at least two or three of those things happening called authorization, recording, verification, manager review. So we see that in a P-card statement. We built those four elements into our payroll reconciliation process. You guys familiar with that? About a year ago, maybe uh, six, nine months ago, you did some training probably on how to review payroll. That same process is built in with Somebody signing timesheets, somebody else is entering it, somebody else is reviewing it. Once a quarter, my manager reviews it, right? Same four elements. Okay, we see it, of course, in the transaction checklist. Uh, verification happens uh, a lot of different ways. These are just some examples within our system. So the next step is custody of assets. It's one of those things I'm not really going to focus a lot on because very few of you are going to have assets that are, um, that are like this type of stuff, that have goods for resale, that turn over a lot. Okay? I know some of you do. Some of you may have some very material assets that amount to a large volume. If you do, I would really encourage you to make an appointment with Andy in his office, have him discuss with you specifically some procedures, and have him meet with you. You guys work out a procedure on how do I implement segregation for custody of assets. Let's develop things like a log list of who's buying stuff, who's checking them out, and make sure it matches with sales. So you'll build in some procedures that help protect you in your office and helps protect the custody of our assets at the university. So what this is about are you know, things that can get up and walk off, that will sprout legs like tickets, uh, perhaps parking permits, things like that that people would want that would be easy to resale that might be attractive to other people. So our final step, we've got something authorized, recorded, I had somebody verifying the transactions all the time for me. And now what happens? Our manager, perhaps a dean or not a dean, would come in and review the transactions. All right? How often do they do this? We're going to talk about that. What are they doing? What does that look like? So here's what the managerial review looks like. All right? It provides assurance first that the controls that I put in place, we designed the control that says you'll do this, this, and this, and this. Great. The manager is responsible for controls in their department. They're responsible to make sure that we implement every one of those policies that we have. That's the manager's job. And their job is to say, are those controls that I put in place still there? Is the segregation still the way that I designed it? So they check that quarterly. It's designed to be a high-level review. If I had, again, we're going back to the optimal world. In the optimal world, I said I had four or five people involved in this process, right? So if I have perfect segregation upstream from me, then whenever it gets to the manager, that means I don't have to do a detail review again, look at every one of the transactions in detail. And it doesn't mean I have to do it every day. That means the manager can rely on the controls they have in place upstream from them. So the manager can do their job quarterly. 
Not only that, it can be a high-level review. That means I can print the income statement, the budget variance, and get a copy of the transaction checklist and just review those. Okay? I don't have to look at every line on the transaction checklist. The manager then is going to look for unusual, unreasonable activity, something that's way out wacky or something like that, or it may look for also things that are missing. So you may look for transactions that just aren't there. Now, this manager, uh, like we said, is going to do things kind of infrequent. Optimally, we'd say, well, we can do this thing once a quarter. We can perform this review periodically because I know my controls are in place, but my other controls need to be working on a daily basis. But the manager review then can work on a quarterly basis. All right, and I'm going to focus again just to bring your attention to the two key words I've got here called should and must. See those two lines? Manager review should not be the same one that's verifying transactions. I didn't say must, but I said should not be. It means we'd like to put the word must there, but it's a should. Okay? Second one is it must not be the one that's recording transactions. Not only that, but they must not be able to record. Okay? You cannot record. This person has to be segregated from the other transactions, the transaction process itself. This person must not be able to record. Now, what does that mean to us? I'll tell you what it meant in my office. It may mean that I've taken away security for my controller. So we've removed security for Jane so that she cannot record transactions. Not only that, but we took the ability to record transactions away from Nikki the VP of Finance. You'd think that surely they'd be able to make a transaction in the financial system, right? Not so. They have to rely on somebody else to make the transaction. Their job is to do the managerial review and nothing more. Okay? Otherwise, what happens if the manager is making transactions? Who's checking their work? Who's preventing fraud for them? Who's detecting it? Nobody. All right? So be careful that your managers, whoever that is, if it's you or someone else above you, that they cannot even make a transaction. That's a key piece of managerial review. So here's some of the suggested documentation that we have. We already talked about it can be either the income statement or the budget variance. It's your choice. Whatever your manager is comfortable reviewing, pick one. Whatever makes most sense. And the transaction checklist. So this checklist of transactions then has uh, perhaps all of the details behind it. It says, you know, here's a thousand dollars for this item and I wonder what it's about. They should be able to flip back and say, who authorized that? Who signed for that stuff? Who said we can spend a thousand bucks? I thought we said we didn't have any budget last month. Somebody spent a thousand bucks on something. How come? So that's their job is to be able to review transactions, to look for some of those anomalies and to periodically just pull some random samples. Just pull a few of them. Say, you know, let's go look at this one. It looks like it got recorded, right? Looks like the right account, right funding source. I see that so-and-so signed it. Yes, I know they're an authorized signer that I wanted signing stuff. So that was all appropriate. What do we do again? I've got to document it and date it. Okay? Here's a bad scenario that we had happen at System. Uh, you know that twice a year, we review our uh, people soft security, right? So we send out this big list and say, review your security, make sure that the people in your office have the right web app security, the right workflow, HR security, and um, people soft delivered. So whenever we were doing that with one of our one of our departments at System, we got to ask the director and said, okay, who's got security to do this and that, and what are the different roles for the different people? And we're meeting with our office, and so we walk through. We're doing great. Everybody's got the security they're supposed to. Okay, who's doing the manager review? I do it. And, and so I said, okay, great. Can you show me the documentation for that? Well, we do it online so that, uh, you know, we use all the web reports, the good delivered web reports. They're pretty good. We like them. So, okay, cool. Can you uh, show me one where you've done the review? Well, we, we, don't really, we don't really document it. We just use it online. Okay. <laughs> you see where I'm going? Is you've got to document it. It's one thing to say, I trust that he's doing his job but we really do have to document and to be able to prove that we did do the review. So this manager, just like the person reviewing, just like the one signing, has to document their work. Again, 
if an auditor comes and asks you for support to say, who's checking the work? Who's doing manager review? In this case, it might be a PI. If the PI is not reviewing their own sponsor program or their own grant, do you think the sponsoring agency is going to trust to give them more money? Probably not. So it's a key element, not just for grants, but for all of our non-sponsored activity as well. All right, so I promised you that we're going to talk about some, uh, giving you the optimal scare tactic. All right, uh, we've lived in the, the theoretical world. Now let's live in what really happens. Okay, so what really happens is this. Well, the first slide, as you can see, is the optimal world. It says I've got four people. These numbers, one, two, and three, represent people in our scenario, in our world. They're not necessarily hierarchical. They're just any, any person in your office. Could be an accountant, a clerk, doesn't really matter. So each one performs a unique function, and we've used PeopleSoft security and PS authorizations to make sure that one person can't do the next person's job. So we've got systems available, tools available, to help segregate these things for us. Keeps it real nice and clean. So please consider whenever you're saying, well, I'm going to use so-and-so as a backup, but they're not, trust me, they're not going to make any of those transactions or do that job unless they really need to. That's not what we call segregation. Segregation means I cannot do it. No way, no how, I just can't. It's impossible for me to do this other job because I don't have security. That's when you know you have segregation implemented in your office. So what does it look like? Well, we just talked about the best one. All right, so we're going to go down the Sears model of good, better, best. We just saw the best. Now it's time to say, okay, let's, maybe I can't afford the best. What do I do next? Next I say, well, I could have good segregation maybe. So in my office, I've only got three people involved. Maybe I've got a manager who has extra time, and they're going to do the verification also. All right, so not only do they have to do the managerial review, but now they're stepped down and doing what? After I've got somebody recording it, authorizing it, now, what's the, remember the function of the person doing the verify? What is it they're doing? They're checking to make sure that what got authorized got recorded, and they're doing that transaction checklist is right. Okay, so they're looking line by line. Now, that's not, it's not a bad thing. You can do it, okay? So it's real possible to do, but here's the consequence we talked about. Remember I told you there's two two overarching goals we had, and there are three different compensating controls. So here's what we've done then. We've implied that this manager now has to pick, pick up on one of those compensating controls, actually two of them. First, they're going to have to do it more frequently. They have to be able to do it in time to catch the errors, right? They've got to be able to detect them in the ordinary course of business. Can't wait once a quarter anymore. It's too late then, right? Now, I know that you guys, before you came, I know that you're diligent accountants. You went home and studied real quick and said, I'm going to be sharp. I'm going to read BPM 213. So what's business policy manual number 213 talk about? All right. BPM 213 is that little policy that we had to put in place to say that you must execute cost transfers, cost corrections, within two months. Right? Remember that one we had to do for PCEs? So you've got to find these errors on a regular basis, an early basis, so that you have time to correct them within two months. That's why that policy is there, that if I can't rely on my financials, if I have errors and irregularities in my financials, do you think your manager is going to be able to make good business decisions? Maybe, maybe not. Depends if it's a $5 error or is it a thousand or $5,000 error. Maybe it affects you significantly. It may make them to make a wrong decision. So it's important that we be able to rely on our, our financials. Second issue with us not being able to have accurate financials is this, that we have a compliance problem. All right? Whenever I post a transaction to a grant or any other thing, particularly with grants, though, that whenever I post something and it's not allocable or not allowable for that, for that grant, my problem is I'm out of compliance immediately. Not at the end of the year. Not at the end of the award. I'm out of compliance immediately. And the sponsors do look and see them. They look for things that we move, particularly. They look for cost corrections that are moving transactions on and off of grants. Maybe a good thing that you found the error, 
But their question is, why are you making the errors? So Joe's going to talk more about that this afternoon. But the first step is that if you do find an error, it's got to be moved timely. That at least shows our auditors and our sponsors that we have a good, a good control in place that detects errors in the ordinary course of business. That's a good thing, that we need to find those errors, but I've got to do it soon. I can't wait quarterly for this guy to do it. Now, the, um, the next step is to say, well, my manager doesn't want to do that role. Maybe they don't have time to do the checklist on a, a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Instead, they're going to keep that to a quarterly basis or try to do that. And here's what we're going to do. This one is still pretty good segregation, but the same one that's authorizing is verifying. So what am I doing now? Remember, I talked about this scenario earlier when I first asked you about that physical misconduct hotline. What I've done is I've put a little extra pressure on this person recording. In a scenario like this, it's often that the person recording works for number one, that they work for that person that is authorizing and then turning around and doing a review. So that's when that person doing the recording needs to have the physical misconduct hotline on their favorites and on their speed dial. All right? So they've got to be ready to use it. They need to know where it is. They need to be able to answer the auditor and management to say, what would you do? I'd use a physical misconduct hotline, especially in this kind of scenario. So it's still pretty good segregation, but the consequence is, again, we talked about the fact that if Steve is doing the authorizing and Steve is doing the verifying, do you think Steve is doing the verifying really that well? Maybe a little iffy. We're not kind of not sure about Steve yet. So what happens? The manager then has to do a little more detail. My manager has to do some more sampling. Instead of just a few random samples, they ought to look some more intently and say, is that the right account? Is that the right funding source? And they're going to have to know more about the business end of the process and say, are those transactions accurate and appropriate? Are they allowable sometimes even? So what I've done is I can still do it quarterly. My manager then can still use this one quarterly, but they've got to do more detail. All right, one of our keys to success is to verify that things are segregated. Who's doing that? The one that's verifying. So my verifier then is making sure that my controls are in place sometimes, that the one authorized and the one recorded is what I wanted. So what have I done again with number three now? Number three also has to be able to use that hotline because we've almost opened the checkbook for somebody. Right? We've almost opened the checkbook and said, here, you can write your own checks. We've given you the power to authorize transactions and the power to record. So then you've got to say, okay, it's one thing for me to check for accuracy in number three, but you've got to wonder, is this first person really uh, maybe spending appropriately, not misappropriating funds, and not making errors? So that's one of the things we, that we put a, a little more pressure on our third person here to look at verify and say, is it appropriate? Should I keep that fiscal misconduct hotline ready? Maybe so. So we've got three people involved still. That's probably a good scenario, right? Three people is a pretty good number. But does it always work? Is it always a great thing? Well, this one actually drops down a notch in our process. Even though I've got three people involved, my reliance now on number two to check his own work it's kind of questionable, isn't it? So what we got is somebody signing. And we got that guy, Steve, recording the transactions. Not only that, but he's checking his own work now. He's making sure he keeps on stuff right. You know, I knew he's what last Monday. He's up late watching a football game. So what do you think Tuesday morning is going to look like? Kind of questionable, huh? So that's why we say that the person that's checking their own work, somebody else really needs to do a follow-up and check their work again. So who does that rely on now? Now I've pushed some of the work off to my manager again to say, you've got to look at stuff more in more detail because I know Steve's not checking his own stuff very good. So the manager now is doing more detailed and he's doing it more frequent. Why does it need to be frequent? Because if Steve is not identifying his errors in a timely basis, the manager has to do it. And they've got to have time to correct the errors before my two-month period. So again, this one is about the same risk. 
that uh, the manager, and I know this happens in my office, we do it, I'm sure that you probably do the same thing. The manager often verifies, I'm sorry, often authorizes transactions. Somebody else records them. And not only that, but they do their own work as well. They're, again, checking their own work. So what happens then? My manager at the end, when they're doing their review process, it's a guarantee. You've got to do it more frequently. That means at least monthly, if not more than monthly. Many departments are doing it more, more than monthly. When they're in that scenario, they know they have the risk and they do it in such a large volume that they do it on a weekly basis or a daily basis. So the manager's got to get engaged and they have to look at every detail transaction. That's the consequence of saying, I can be short staffed, I can ha not have the in perfect environmental scenario that I wanted for segregation, but when I'm not optimal, that means the manager has to kick in a significant effort to do all the detail and do it at least monthly. All right, here's our last one to say this one is one that we would, we kind of shake in our boots whenever we see this in departments. We know it happens. It's just a fact of life. All right, it's a fact of this is what we are as a university with the staff I've got in my department. This is what I have to do. Okay, when we have to do this, can you guess what the scenario is for the manager? What's my manager got to do now? Remember my two, two or three compensating controls? My two are more frequent, more detail. So this in case, the manager has to do everything absolutely. They have to look at for all the key punch errors. So they're looking for that. They're looking to make sure that things are authorized appropriately, that there's nothing inappropriate. They're going to find ways to say, is this fraudulent or not? Is it a misappropriation of funds? Are things accurate? So they've got to be a skilled accountant now. They put themselves in that spot. If I can't just be a business manager, now I've got to know accounting 101. All right, here's the final one. This one is unacceptable. If you have this in your office, anybody want to say, that's the way it is in my office? No, I hope you know. This one, we, we do find people that says, yep, I've got it. Here's the thing not to do. You can't have one person doing it all. All right, at least whenever we have uh, our own checkbook personally at home. Uh, I write my own checks sometimes, and I don't have to answer to anybody. I don't have to check with them. I just keep writing checks, right? Well, that's okay until I have to answer to one person at the end, the bank. Okay? This scenario doesn't even have the bank involved. It just lets somebody write blank checks. Okay? So this one is a big scenario where I am not deterring fraud at all, and I have no one to detect errors. Two huge risks that we cannot endure any longer. So if you are in this scenario, I want you to put on your note, I must call Andy today. I need your help. I want you to call him and say, Andy, I'm one of those guys that he was talking about that says don't do this. This is the thing, don't do. If you are in this spot, that's okay. Not going to go to jail. But I want you to call Andy and say, I need help. I need help to work out of this scenario. I need you to come and visit with me, talk to my manager, my my whoever it is, administration and say, you've got to help me. I've got to have more staff. I've got to have somebody engaged in this process, figure out a way to dig out. Okay? All right. So next part is this. So we, we talked for a few minutes about segregation, about what it is, kind of defined it, giving you some a roadmap of, you know, here's some scenarios of what to do, what not to do. Now, the rest of the slides are these. I'm going to let you take the rest of the thing home, but I'm going to ask you to not cheat. No cheating. No flipping the papers, okay? So the rest of it, we're going to have fun. I'm going to put one slide up at a time. It'll be a question, and I want you to answer. So it'll be audience fun time. I want you to answer, and then feel free to have any other follow-on questions that you want. So there's your quiz. How does this policy change the interaction with accounting? It doesn't. There are no changes with the county. I haven't talked about you have to do something different with Andy now or the county office from now on. No. There's no changes yet. I haven't talked about anything different you've got to do. So they're still going to check PS authorization. If they see a non-field voucher come across, they're still going to look for an authorized signer just like before. No difference there. How about this one? There's an email from a manager to order some stuff 
substantiate authorization? Is that good or not? Is that good documentation? Yes. Yes? You bet. That's the key. Print something out that says Steve sent an email on this date, on this date, and it has the chart fields in it to say, please go buy something from this debt ID, this grant, whatever it is. But yes, that's excellent documentation. You can do two things. You can either keep it hard copy, print it out, keep it hard copy with the transaction, or number two, I can store the email. But if I keep the email, I've got to comply and make sure that you have good storage uh, retention requirements. Okay? So you need to look at record retention. Make sure that you keep those emails according to our record retention policies. Does a manager's verbal request to order items meet the requirements for authorization? No, I told you, my manager just told me. Remember, I'm the guy that may or may not confront him. So you sure I want to say no? No, verbal doesn't work. Got to be written authorization. Somewhere, somehow, either written or electronic, that transaction has to be documented, right? Does the manager's, I'm sorry, you have a question? I have a question about these last two slides. I can see how that applies to fairly large. My manager does not simply tell me to look over a Xerox paper every month, but it's in my job description to keep the office supplied. Excellent question. So I don't know if you all heard that. She asked, what happens for, I'm going to phrase it this way. We're going to answer one of the questions that we're going to have in a few minutes also. That if I have to my job description says, go order supplies all the time. Keep the office stocked with order supp office supplies. And it's part of my job. Then what do I do? Do I still need to have somebody sign it every time? The answer is that if it's part of your job description and by the fact that they hired you to fulfill that job, that is your authorization. It's a narrow authorization. It doesn't say, yes, I can go buy 60 inch plasmas, but it does say I can go at, buy some office supplies. That's excellent documentation and that's acceptable, yes. Okay, how about a manager's unsigned fax? They were out of town and they faxed me something says, go buy something. Is that good stuff? Good authorization? Sign the fax. That's exactly right. Got to have a signature somewhere, somehow. Okay? Now, here's our, here's our real answer on this one. This is one of those should must things. What we should do, we should follow up with the original. So it's great that somebody faxed me something, gave me some cookie covers and details of the order some stuff, but it's really a better idea to eventually follow up with the original. We'd like to have an original hard copy signature if we can. All right, until we get into the modern, the complete 100% electronic stage, we'd really like to have that original hard copy signature somewhere. So it's okay to say, I need to go ahead and start the process, get the purchasing kicked off, that's okay. How about, does a manager's request in a department meeting satisfy the request for authorization? So everybody heard me. You're all witnesses, right? It's hot in here. Andy said, go get a fan. I'm going to go get a fan. Yeah, but I have 100 witnesses. It needs to be in the minutes. It's got to be in the meeting minutes. So yes, it's okay if it's in the meeting minutes. And second, those minutes have to be distributed to people. To everyone that was in the meeting, they have to be pushed out. You have to push the meeting minutes to them or notify them that they have been published. Yes, sir. So does that imply that for every meeting you have or every part of the meeting, even there's a minutes to take in? So I guess the question is, that do I have to always take minutes every time at every meeting? Uh, I would answer it like this. If, you, if the expectation is that somebody in that meeting is going to give authorization, then yes, you've got to have minutes. You know, I, I don't know how your meetings work, but if you are having meetings and it's frequent that somebody says, go buy this, go buy that, go do this, yeah, you better have some minutes. And I would say as a rule, I'd start doing it every time. Yes, sir. So the question, to go back to the slides, ordering on the slides, we have a conference organization here. It puts on conferences routinely for everything from pencils 
go on up the scale, more prizes, some things that were more suspicious, but it's still a routine operation during the authorization of the kick in. The authorization, when you talk about level, it's not really a materiality issue nearly as much as is it in someone's job description, like we asked before, is it in somebody's job description to buy conference materials or to, to buy that? Is that true? Do they, is it in somebody's job description to buy those routinely? Yes. Okay. Then if it's in their job description to go buy routine conference materials, yes, that's good authorization. But here's what happens. We need to think about that there's nothing wrong with us saying later that a manager would still like to see things and still authorize them. There's two options there. So things like a P card, even with P card, we're still going to authorize them later when we sign the P card statement. That's still excellent author authorization. It's whenever I'm signing P card statements. Is that typically what we're doing? It's after the fact. Remember I told you up front, I said we're going to talk about the theoretical perfect world where I authorize, then I go record. I understand that I'm flip flop sometimes. Okay? Sometimes I actually go buy something, then I get it authorized. That's that's understandable. And we, we understand that you can't always get everybody to sign every fifty cent item I'm gonna go buy. So what we do is we say, yes, I've got to get it authorized. Before it gets to the verification or the manager review stage, everything must be authorized. Yes? In our office we implemented an authorization authorization to order form. They have to fill it out. PI has to sign it. Then they bring it to us to order it. And if the PI has not signed it, we do not order it. Okay. They fill this on it, and they have to list everything they want. They have to list the company they want it ordered from. It's all this information, or it simply does not get ordered. Okay. Here's the P card comes in the place. Right. Here's one of the solutions he said. I know somebody didn't hear it, so I'll repeat it for you. That what she said was in their office, they've implemented a, a, a form, an authorization form, where they put on where they put on the form that the PI will sign something that says, I authorize the transaction to be purchased from this funding source, this grant or other funding source. It needs to be purchased from this company. Here's the item, the quantity, the amount. And so they sign and date that. And if they don't, she's not going to purchase the transaction. She's not going to go make the transaction initially. Now that's, I mean, that's one of the things that if you can do that, that's the optimal world. That's an excellent way to do it. But again, I know that not everybody's going to say, I can do that in my office. If you can, that's wonderful. That's the best control you can get. Yeah, especially if you have a small office. Sometimes you have to do those kind of things. It's the only way we can do it. Yep. Did I have another question? I'm not sure I do. I flipped my hand up. <laughs> Along the same guidelines as the, the coordination of activities across the department, we may have departments who need to purchase items for the faculty who is involved, but it's not part of my department. Um, so I hold the account. They're responsible for the payroll. Um, how do we reconcile all those things? When you, when you use the word reconcile, do you mean do the verification stage? Yeah. All right. Here's what it counts on my tree, on my end of the tree. So I'm going to have the verification and the expenses right. show up on my account. Here's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have the verification and the expenses show up on my account. Okay. But they transact all of the transactions. You know, that's okay. One of the things that I, I tried to make a point of on verification is and I don't want to oversimplify it and I don't want to dumb down the role that the verifier plays. But we could look at the verifier simplistically and say the verifier could see transactions made from hundreds of different debt IDs. The verifier's role is to look at the original documentation to say somebody signed for something that says pay something from this chart field string. It looks like an authorized signer. They look in general ledger and say it got recorded from this chart field string on this date for this much money. Those two things match or they don't match. It could be that simplistic if you wanted to, to put verification that way. So it's okay that this verifier, we're not asking the verifier to have intimate knowledge about every grant, about every transaction that goes on in a department. It's probably not practical to do. So as a result, then, that verifier is somewhat, dis can be disassociated from the authorization phase. Remember, that authorized signer 
is the one who is making sure that things are allowable, allocable, that complies with all of our policies, our collected rules, it's legal, and I have budget for it. That's their role as an authorized signer. My role as a verifier is simply to make sure that I have authorized transactions and it got recorded accurately. Does that kind of help? To say what it, yes, no? Yes. You're going to need to have someone in your department authorize transactions. So the question was that if I have somebody signing on a P card or somebody making P card transactions from another department, but they're spending my money, how does that get authorized? Do I need to authorize it or is it okay for them to sign it? It's not okay for them to sign it. As an authorizer, I need to sign and have budget responsibility. Remember we talked about those things. There's collected rules, policies, compliance, legal, and budget. Budget's my job for my budget, right? It's not your job. It's not somebody else's job. It's not Andy's. It's not Mary Ann's. It's your job to manage your budget. So that means that if somebody else is spending money out of your bucket, you need to authorize the transaction. Now, again, it's one of those things you could do it after the fact to say somebody's going to get the P card statement. They can sign it, send you a copy of all the transactions. Say you need to authorize this statement as well. Yes. In most cases, we, by way of email, they you know can request for this charge and we say please charge it to the money and therefore we have the emails. Is that sufficient? to document. Yes. Email is an excellent way, again, to document charges to say, can I get an email from somebody across the across campus that says, I authorize you to charge my debt ID X amount of money out of these chart fill strings. Uh, that's, and they have it, of course, dated, and they have their electronic uh, Outlook signature on it. So that means, yes, it is okay. That's excellent documentation, and I don't need to have additional follow-up signatures. That email is excellent. Department saying, my Are those secretaries authorized signers? Then they should not be authorizing signatures. They cannot authorize transactions. Only authorized signers can authorize transactions. Here's, let me help you out with that one for just a minute. I know you're thinking in my mind, okay, how can I get the authorized signers to type the long email that says do this, that, and the other thing and get them to take the time to do that, here's what you do. You help them out and say, I'm going to, as the secretary or administrative assistant, I'm going to type all the email that says buy this, buy that, charge this debt ID funding source, send it to my boss and say, please forward this on to XYZ. All they've got to do is hit approved, send it to so-and-so. It's that short. Just type in the word approved and forward it on to the other place. Does that help? It'll shortcut them, and it'll also get some the authorized signer in the loop. They must authorize transactions. Yes? What about spending that goes on between departments on campus? For example, we host a lot of special events throughout every week. So you have a staff person whose responsibility is to organize a special event. They have to contact you. You know, set up catering, put in a work order for physical, physical facilities, there are costs involved with both of those things. Do they need an email from their supervisor to do those steps, or if they know it's part of their job, can they just go ahead and place those orders between departments on campus and author, you know, authorize those? Okay. Uh, so the question, if I could summarize, is this that if I'm buying things from another department, either on campus or off campus, but if I'm buying something from another department, and I would include that if I'm buying it from an external entity, somebody outside, I'm going to some catering service to buy stuff or other supplies, then the answer would still be the same. Whoever is authorizing the transaction needs to be an authorized signer. They need signature authority somewhere, somehow. Now, there's two ways to do it. One is I can put myself in PS authorization to be an authorized signer. And of course, you'll do that through the accounting office. So if somebody that has authority will send an email that says, put Steve in there for now and he's going to be buying stuff and he's an authorized signer on the step ID. That's one choice. Second choice is I can modify the job description to say it is my job from now on to buy conference supplies to keep conferences stock maintained. 
and make it a narrow scope to say, you know, you don't, you don't have to put in everything it excludes, but you can put in the things that are typical that would be included in their job role. Does that help? So it's. I don't need to, exactly. I don't need to keep going to my boss to get approval, approval, approval. Okay. How about the signature stamp? So we've got signature stamps. We get tired of sending those things, and we just stamp them, and and it's a nice, efficient process, right? No. So no, it's not a good process. All right. Thank you. So no, the signature stamp is not authorization. That is not an effective signature. Okay? It should be rejected, and I would encourage you to throw that stamp away, please. The only thing you want to use a stamp for is to sign some kind of informal letter that you're sending around, perhaps an internal memo. But otherwise, you shouldn't be using it as a formal authorization. So, again, retain documentation. If I sign something, got to keep it. Okay, how about, and I, I think we may have beat this one up, about frequently purchased items like office supplies and so on. We know that we have various ways. One is we buy them internally, or if it's in my job description, I keep up with conference supplies or office supplies. So we're going to see approvals through things like that. But the mechanisms that record that authorization are what? Here's the mechanisms. And this is just examples. Again, we have signatures on non-PO vouchers. We have signatures or electronic signatures on EPRO and on requisitions. So you'll see those. That's, that's effective signatures. You don't have to go get another signature if you put in an EPRO rec. Your email works great. And we have P cards. So the P card has signatures for authorized signers on it as well. Now, this afternoon, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to encourage you to listen to Joe's spiel on P card. He's going to talk to you more about some of the intricacies and some of the problems we've had with pay cards. One of those problems is not that you can't use it. We still want you to use it. It's a good thing. It's a good tool that uh, is simple and efficient. But he's going to talk to you about the way we use pay cards. One of those ways that we misuse it is we use it as a default for a grant. All right? That's one of the problems we've seen across campuses. When you have that pay card as the default value, default mode code for a grant, what do you think happens? Every transaction usually goes there, right? Whatever doesn't go there or whatever doesn't uh, belong or allocable to it, then I'll just move those later with a journal entry and move them off. Well, remember back to my compliance thing? If I'm out of compliance for a minute, just one day, that's all it takes to say, I am out of compliance. So my OIG auditors, they'll come in and they'll say, you were out of compliance that day, this week, two months, whatever it took for you to find that thing that got misallocated to that grant and move it, they see it immediately. They said, why are you moving things in and out? It's because you're posting unallowable expenses to our grant. And that's not a good conversation to have. Okay? So how about this? Can an individual authorize transactions for themselves? No. Not travel. What about other reimbursements? No. no. How come? You want my two goals? Detect, deter fraud. You betcha. So no, travel's got to be signed by who? By my friends. No. <laughs> got to be signed by, by my administrative superior. Okay? Not their buddy, not anybody else, but my administrative superior. Which may or may not be the person authorized on the that's a good point. If they are not authorized on the, on the debt ID or on that funding source, then you need to take it to two places and get an authorization for spending and by administrative signature. Excellent point. Can the same individual authorize, record, and verify? So I've just thrown segregation out the window. Okay. Is that okay? Not really. Not really is the great answer. Not recommended, but yes, the answer has to be there, yes. So it's one of those should things. All right. But we are going to rely heavily on my manager, right? Now my manager has gone to more frequent and more detail review. So it's got to be no less than monthly. Can't do it anything less than monthly. 
All right, what is verification? What should it include? What does it look like? Help me out. What? I'm, it's got to be documented. Excellent. It's got to be signed and dated. What am I doing? I'm confirming. Excellent. What am I confirming? Confirming accuracy to make sure that what got authorized got recorded the way I wanted it, right? Good job. And again, we can say it can be electronic or paper. Here's what we mean by that. If you want to print the tra transaction checklist out and have somebody sign that, that's okay to do that too. We'd highly recommend you just do it online and keep it there. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But if you want, you can print the silly thing off and then have somebody sign. How often do we do verification? I've heard the word. Oh, that's a great answer. Who said that? Depends on the level of segregation. All right, several of these answers are going to be that trick answer. All right. So, yes, I'd like to do it no less than monthly. Must be done no less than monthly, but it really depends on the segregation. If I have excellent segregation upstream, then I can do it monthly. If I don't, maybe between my first two things of authorization recording, the verifier better do it pretty good, pretty frequent. So, how come? Back to BPM 213, where I've got to catch things timely. How do we document it? Checklist. Right. Checklist is a, is a good answer. There are several examples. We do it through things like the P card. You do it on your payroll reconciliation when you're reviewing those thing, those documents. You're also doing verification then for that, that part of the transaction. If any of you here have uh, another database, is anybody dumping transactions out of PeopleSoft into another database? Yes? Here's, here's the problem with that. It's not a problem, but here is one more step you need to take. Whenever you're doing that, we need you to run a reconciliation between the two systems. We need you to show a report of all the expenditures in PeopleSoft, and then we need you to run a report of all the expenditures in your access database or whatever else you're using. We need you to prepare a reconciliation between those two that says all the things that hit one place hit the other place. Prepare the reconciliation, then I need to take that reconciliation and hand it to somebody else. All right, Hand it to my manager and let them review that reconciliation. It must not be the same person that, re that prepared the reconciliation or the one that prepared the interface that builds that database. So it's got to be independent. My manager's got to do it or somebody like that that can be independent of the process that can review the reconciliation. So if you have one of those databases, I also would encourage you to please contact your accounting office. Call the accounting office, call Andy and say, you know, I've got this other thing going on. I'd like you to take a look at it. See if it meets the good, a good control environment for me. They'll be glad to come and see you, come and visit with you and say, let's talk specifically about what pages am I doing, what does this thing look like, what queries am I running. Make sure you have good integrity in that process before we blast off and do it. So how about the person who authorizes and verifies? Is that okay? It's okay to do. But what's the consequence? Got to think. Yeah, it's not recommended. It's not one of those optimal things. But in that case, then I've got additional controls I've got to put in place, right? Okay. So what am I going to do? Probably do the manager then. Since the verifier is doing the work, and they're checking their own work, really, then my manager has to start doing more detail and more frequent. What does the manager's review include? Manager's review is going to include high level. It's going to look at things like the income statement, the budget variance, and a, a glance at the transaction checklist. And they're going to look for unusual anomalies, right? Look for unusual things, high level. Again, it's got to be documented. What documents do we have? We just talked about that, right? The documents for the manager review are income statement or budget variance and transaction checklist. How often do we do it? It depends. Good answer. Good point. All right. So the, the, quest, the question really is, if I were living in the optimal world, what would it be? Quarterly. Quarterly. 
be a quarterly high-level review. By quarterly, that means that I can pick one out of the three months. I don't have to review every one of them. I can pick one out of the last three months, pull that one, look at the income statement budget variance, scan some of the transactions, pull a couple of samples, sign it, and I'm done. All right? Now, what happens on the other end of the spectrum when I have one person doing everything else? What's the manager doing? Doing it every month, without a doubt, every month. That would be up to you and how you have somebody in that manager review spot. It, it, no, okay. The question is, do I, whenever let's say I'm doing that quarterly review, and I have multiple debt IDs, multiple income statements or projects underneath me, and out of, let's say I've got 10 or 20 different responsibility centers or cost centers. When I do that, that means that every one of those cost centers or chart fill strings needs to be checked at least quarterly. That means that if I've got 10 of them, that means every quarter I need to do 10 reviews. Uh, here's what I said: that you, out of, if I have ten depth IDs underneath me, I'm a manager. I've got ten different depth IDs, ten projects, what have you. Then my answer is that I need to look at every one of them once a quarter. So that I've got project A, I need to look at it thing at least once out of the out of the three months. Project B, I've got to look at it once out of the three months. Depth ID, same way. Yes. Why do you consider the scenario typical like a dean in the you know, university system where there were several departments that dean was responsible for? Each one of those departments had accounts and budgets and things as well. But that dean had all the responsibility for things being proper. And we, is it, what's the best scenario for, for that from the dean's perspective, making sure? What you might see at a dean's level, we're going to imagine a very large department for just a minute, where the dean would have not 10 depth IDs, but hundreds. Okay? So let's put ourselves in that scenario. Am I saying that the dean needs to look at 100 different financial statements? Probably not. Instead, they're most likely to delegate that to somebody else underneath them to have some other assistant or associate that's going to do some of those things and divide them up so that it's a reasonable workload for them. So I wouldn't expect one person to even be remotely familiar with 100 or 200 different depth IDs or cost centers. That would be unreasonable to think that you could be familiar enough to make a good judgment. So as a result, in a large department, you're going to see delegation of some of those responsibilities. That means the manager kind of has shifted down. Then the dean then could look at a high level, a summary financial. With departments like that, they often use access to combine the financials, print out a summary statement that gives them a quick overview of 200 depth IDs at one time. Does that help? Okay. What if we do have over 100 charcoal If you have over 100 different charcoal strings, I think that was... Uh, okay. That would be the same. I think the same answer. If I've got 100 of them, my, my encouragement would be that you either split up some of the work, but either way, in both, both scenarios, I still need to review each one of those depth IDs at least once quarterly. Somebody's got to do it. If the dean doesn't do it, then somebody else has to. So it's fine to delegate work down to a different manager level. But then we talk about that manager level, whoever it is that I delegate down to. Remember, one of their qualifications is they can't be recording transactions. So, for example, an academic department that a dean is responsible for, and that dean has five of those departments, if there was a separation of duties, each one of those departments that were aligned appropriate for the number of uh, debt IDs, for example, or the size of the department. Could that be a good scenario? Have each department be responsible, and let's say the head of the chair of that department, and then the dean simply uses yes. the check and balances that the chair has used. Excellent, excellent deal. Let me let me go down that path with you for just a minute. What he's asking is. If the, the dean or a chair of a department has five major departments underneath them, right? So they've got five major areas. And then the, the answer is that could I have a, a head of each one of those departments, right? So, yes, they can delegate that responsibility down to a department level and say each one of those people then have five, ten, twenty different depth IDs underneath them. Then, yes, they can do that. 
there's there's nothing wrong with that. The dean then doesn't isn't bound by this quarterly review or detailed statement or what have you. That then has been delegated down to a manager of a department, if you will. Um, so there, that's a a good scenario again. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Again, the qualification of that person doing that managerial review, and the reason we didn't use the words when we use the words verifier, authorizer, recorder, and managerial review. We don't mean to give those things titles, all right? Typically, we'll see that the manager may have a dean title, but that's not a rule, okay? Nor is it a chair or whatever you want to call it. It's not a title thing. It's one of those things that they have and fulfill that responsibility or not. So the verifier, again, could be clerical, it could be staff, professional, could be an associate director, a director, it doesn't matter. The title is irrelevant in this scenario, in segregation. What is important is that we have the appropriate duties assigned to and, and segregated. So that's our goal. Yes, sir. Is this one of the times where you would really want to have a delegation of authority letter on file for these specific things? We don't need to do a delegation of authority for non-sponsored activity. But certainly for sponsored activity, you're going to have to talk heavily this afternoon about that delegation. It would not hurt at all. And we know that some departments do that to say, let's say Jane gives me responsibility to do some certain review of certain areas. Either one would be in my job description or number two. It wouldn't be a bad idea to have a formal letter that says, Steve, I'm going to hold you responsible for reviewing the bank recons and this and that and the other thing. Don't cover the job description. They have that extra down at the bottom. There are certain things that are more appropriate for someone in a lower level to be handling. The team is still responsible or whoever. But with that delegation authority, at least you have delegated that job, if you will, or that activity. And then the need is then free to look at prior numbers. Right. I mean, that's yes, that's correct. In other words, I could, if I, if I could, I would write everything into in someone's job description. That would be the great scenario, is to say that what my responsibilities are. If I can't, then yes, it would be great to have a delegation letter, if you will, some formal document. Um, but short of that, but sometimes by simple implication of my responsibilities, I am responsible for things like that. As an example, when I walk in the door, they told me you're responsible to do bank recon. I don't think that my job description says that, but I know it's my job and I do it. Uh, but it's a, a good question that I've got now in my mind. Should I have it documented? Maybe we should. The yeah, auditor probably wouldn't, but they will take somebody that they'll look then to say, Okay, I can see this. Steve is reviewing the bank reconciliations that somebody else does. Okay, now the question is, if he's reviewing it, what kind of independence and what kind of segregation does he have? Was he segregated from the process or did he make all the transactions too? So that's when they're going to look and see for things like that. So that's why we, we hesitate to put titles around any one of these roles that we play. As a manager, it's hard to say, oh, you have to be a dean, you have to be a chair, you have to be a this or a director or whatever. So this manager role can be played by many different titles. Dr. Collier's remark and this question where somebody is responsible for multiple departments, each department has multiple projects, all having different types of Is it not acceptable? Uh, I mean, people probably have this lovely query where you can download everything and present it to the dean or whatever in a collapsed format so that they can see everything. Yes. Yes. If they could use that, so if he did that quarterly for every department, download everything, give a summarization. He can ask these questions on specific key things. You can produce the documentation for it. Is that an appropriate review? I uh, know that would probably not be an appropriate review. The appropriate review needs to be at a chart field string level, from a managerial review perspective. Now, I'm going to qualify it by saying this. It's unlikely that a dean is going to look at 100 different cost centers or, or programs or projects underneath them. Chances are they should have, or I'm sorry, a recommended procedure would be to have somebody underneath them saying, you look at these 50. You look at those 20 or 50. So they'll de delegate that to someone else.
that would be the preferred way to say, I'm going to look at the detail, do the manager review, then run a query out of PeopleSoft or run whatever that summarizes things, hand it to that dean or chair level, and have that department head look at it. Excellent. Then we've got a home run right there. But then it wants quarterly, the dean gets a download of sure. all of his departments that reconcile to that. Is that yes, absolutely appropriate. Yes. The key, the key for the to answer that question was, what is it that constitutes the managerial review? What constitutes that managerial review is whenever I'm looking at a detailed income statement and I'm reviewing the, the checklist. And that's what those department heads, I think you call them, that's what they're looking at is the detail. Then whenever I roll that up to uh, a chair or, or dean level, then yes, it's perfectly appropriate to do that. But down at the detail level, that's when it's got to be done either the monthly or the quarterly, depending on segregation. So as long as I'm meeting the requirements of monthly, quarterly down there, then it's okay to roll up to a high level for someone else. And yes, they can certainly do it quarterly. Does that help kind of clarify that? Okay. Okay, so now I've dropped off the world of optimal segregation. I know we've, we've gone down this path a lot, but I no longer have optimal segregation of duties. What do I do now? What are some of the additional things I can do? Remember my three? What are my three things? More frequent, more detail, share resources, right? Okay, so there's my answer. Do more more frequent review, perform monthly, perform more detail. All right. So again, we get to what would I talk about today is my summary. We'd say the best world I can get to, back to my good, better, best model. This is one of those great models that say, optimally, I'd have four or five people involved in this process, four people involved just in the transaction process. All right? But if I can't, what am I going to do? Going to put three things in place. More detail, more frequent, shared resources. So those are key. Remember my compensating controls. That if I can't do it, I've got the consequence is I've got to put something else in place. Why do I need to put those things in place? What's my goal? My goal is two things. My goals are mitigate the risk of fraud and detect errors in the ordinary course of business. Okay, so those keep those goals in mind whenever I'm thinking about, okay, why am I putting that control in place? What's my goal? Of, of, of why do I need to do more frequently? Why do I need more detail? It's because I'm trying to either detect errors or deter fraud. So we've gone through the first policy today. The first one is just about the good fiscal management, good guidelines, good strong internal controls for segregation of duties. The next one this afternoon, remember, is going to be talking about delegation of some of those responsibilities we did this morning. So in addition to everything we've talked about right now, I want you to look at and focus on this afternoon what happens whenever the PI says, I'm not going to authorize everything. I just can't sign every little document. I don't have time for that. I don't know the account numbers. I don't know what chart fields. I don't know what a mo code is. What do I do? Sometimes they need to delegate that responsibility. And that's what we're going to talk about is what's involved in delegation. So I would encourage you to, to uh, attend this afternoon to talk about the sponsor programs piece of segregation duties. The short, the short read is BPM 213. Please refresh yourself with that policy. We've kind of talked about it a little bit. <clears throat> you only have two months to fix transactions. If you find an error, you've got two months. And finally is, if you haven't looked at the misconduct hotline, I would encourage you to go out and look at it for just a second. Take two or three minutes out of your day. Just go look at the website. Even click on the deal. It says add a case. So go report an incident just for fun. All right? You should see what Andy's buying. All right? <laughs> so go out there. Experiment with the thing. Just don't hit save unless you're serious. All right? But uh, I would encourage you to look at the fiscal misconduct hotline. It's really not a, a scary site. It would be great to do. But also, it's something that I want you to go back and teach your staff. Tell anyone that works in your office, anyone, that they have this option, that they need to know about the fiscal misconduct hotline. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
I just want to verify something. I didn't win your authorization in the Android department. And I currently know I have the security to input CLRs, uh, non field document, work positions, payroll, and all of that shit. Am I supposed to take that security away to be able to input all that stuff? Yes, ma'am. Here's a, here's a question if you didn't hear it. That she's in the role of the manager review and she also, also authorizes for transactions. So I talked about that. We know that it happens everywhere that my manager oftentimes has the power and should be able to sign for their own stuff. But the question then is, but I also have the authority to do CRRs. I can get in, enter a CRR, enter payroll or what have you. And that's a case where we have opened the checkbook wide open and we cannot have that. That is unacceptable. So that one is unacceptable. We must remove your access to inner transactions. That means that, I don't want to be critical, but that means nobody's checking your work. Nobody's looking for fraud. So it doesn't mean that we don't trust you. We like it. <laughs> now, does that also mean accounts receivables too? Yes, ma'am. It means any transaction. You should not be reporting or cannot report any transaction. So no invoices like you put any invoices? No. That's the manager's role. That's the price of payments. Whenever, let's talk about the purchasing card for just a minute. When, if I'm in that role and I have a P card, that's almost the same as, and it, it's a gray area to say, is it really recording the transaction or is it uh, authorizing the transaction? In one way, you could say, every time I take a P card to the store and I buy something, it's essentially authorizing the transaction. So would that be okay to authorize with that, with the P card? Yes. But the question then is, I need then somebody else to be doing the verification. Somebody looking at that statement, verifying it, saying somebody else signing beside you, say, I'm looking at the P card, the account numbers look appropriate based on all these receipts that you turned in, and yes, I'll sign it. Then you're okay with that. As long as you've segregated something in there, we've got to have somebody else involved, looking at the P card, reviewing the statement online, changing mo codes when appropriate. Okay, any other questions? All right, we're done early, right? All right, you guys did good on the quiz. One more thing real fast. One final thing. If you did not do, I need you two things from you. Did everyone sign up on the uh, attendance? Okay, that needed to, if you'll do two things for me then, please. Sign up real quick. Put your name on it, front or back. And the third thing, I'm sorry, the second thing is, I need you to do your evaluation. We do take them seriously. We do read them. Um, I want your comments on them, and please leave them on one of the back tables or leave them on the table where you are. Thank you, guys.